Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. I want to thank you for carving time out of your day to join us this afternoon. Um, today's presentation, the Living with ALS Educational Topic Call Series, is a series of webinars designed to bring information of a practical nature to those living with ALS, people that are diagnosed with ALS, their caregivers, uh, ALS chapter care service staff, as well as ALS clinical clinicians join us for these calls. Um, this afternoon, our topic is going to be promoting adequate nutrition, how a feeding tube helps, again, with the focus on bringing practical information to our audience. Just a couple housekeeping uh, comments here. If you have questions or comments, would you kindly insert those into the chat box? I'll be monitoring that so I can provide a, an answer to a technical question you may have, but I'll also share those questions or comments during the Q&A session. In addition, you may have just heard that this re, uh, call is being recorded. We do place the recorded webinars on the ALS Association website because people find that they want to go back and re-listen to the webinar or for those folks who may not be able to uh, attend the webinar live in their schedule. Um, this afternoon, we are pleased to have a subject matter expert joining us to bring us some insight on the value of feeding tubes. Stephanie Doback is a master's prepared registered dietitian. She's a clinical dietitian with the Jefferson Weinberg ALS Center in Philadelphia. Hi. Stephanie, I believe you are already on the call and have your slide deck lined up for us. So I'm going to turn this over to you so you can begin. Again, if you have any questions or comments, please do submit those to the chat box, and we'll review those during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and I'm super excited to be talking with you today. I'm very passionate about this topic. I think we don't discuss feeding tubes enough or that they have a stigma around them, so I'm excited to share some information with you today. I have no disclosures related to this topic. Our objectives today are to understand the purpose and indications for feeding tube placement, define the advantages and disadvantages of feeding tubes, and list techniques involved in feeding tube care. So we know there's a lot of reasons why we eat what we eat. And I would love to say that we just confine it to the nutritional aspect, the nutrients, the energy, the hydration, but we know that the emotional and social aspects play large parts as well. So for emotional, of course, I'm not promoting emotional eating, but we do know that's a reality and that sometimes when we have sadness or um, we need a coping mechanism, we turn to food. For anxiety and stress, sometimes people go home and have a glass of wine or their favorite comfort food to deal with those emotions. For reward processing, I know when I was a kid, whenever we got good grades on a reward, Card. Our parents took us to Dairy Queen to get some blizzards to reward us for that. And then we also have the joy of cooking. Some people just love to cook and it's their hobby. And of course, you're going to eat as you cook. And so those are some reasons why we eat what we eat. Uh, also, we might just, just love the food. It's yummy. We take pleasure in eating it. And so that's another reason. Social for events. There's rarely going to be an event that you attend that doesn't have food. So Weddings or graduation parties, bridal showers, wedding showers, um, baby showers, graduation parties, all these events are going to be centered around food traditions. I know every family has their food tradition. For me growing up, whenever I went to my grandmother's house, she would also always have scotcheroos, which are peanut butter rice crispy treats, and they were delicious. And I'm, even though I work in Philadelphia now, I'm originally from the South. Georgia, and so in the South for New Year's Day, food tradition is typically greens, black eyed peas, pork, and cornbread. So these things that we, we think will bring you good luck in the new year. So there's a lot of food traditions out there. And for influencers, so I know going around during the pandemic, there, everyone was encouraged to make sourdough bread, or right now there's that baked feta pasta that's really popular right now. So we know the people that we're looking at um, they might be promoting a different restaurant or a different food item that we would like to try. But when we have a diagnosis like ALS, that can kind of shift the influence over to the nutritional aspect of it. 
and, and eating becomes more of a survival mode because we know that weight is associated with survival. And now we might be asking you to eat foods that you normally wouldn't eat. So we might be concerned about weight loss and try to get some high calorie drinks into you like Ensure or Boost. We might be asking you to take your favorite foods and make them higher calories, such as adding butter or cream or sugar to the foods. We also might see that swallowing is becoming difficult for you. So we might ask you to modify the texture and make it more soft and give you swallowing techniques. So all this is changing why we eat what we eat when we do have a diagnosis such as ALS. And nutrition is so important because we know that malnutrition can negatively impact survival rate. So this one study that I quoted below, they followed ALS patients for one year and they looked at mortality, as you can see on this axis, and they compared it to BMI. And BMI, body mass index, is a ratio of height and weight. And a normal BMI is considered the 18.5 to almost 25. So less than that is underweight, and 25 to almost 30 is overweight. And starting at 30, we have the obesity categories. And you can see that the researchers noted this U-shaped association between BMI and mortality, in that patients with a higher BMI, class one obesity, um, BMI of 30 to close to 35, at baseline was associated with longer survival. They don't really know why this is. It might be related to muscle stores or lean body mass. Um, but we do know that ALS is a progressive neuromuscular disease. And because of that, by just the disease process itself, you are going to lose muscle mass. If you don't get enough calories in, your body will start eating away at fat stores and at muscle stores, which will accelerate the muscle loss. So our goal is to maintain our weight. Um, if you're in this, these lower BMI categories, less than 25, we actually encourage you to gain a little bit of weight. But at a certain point, when you get to this class two and, and morbid obesity categories, weight is no longer beneficial. And that's likely because it's associated with um, worsening physical function, transferring is harder, moving in bed is harder, and then respiratory function, particularly if you hold your weight in your abdominal section and it's pressing on your diaphragm to make breathing more difficult. At the same time, we know that there's challenges involved in maintaining weight. So you have physical challenges. We have hypermetabolism, and that's just a fancy word of saying your body burns more calories. So when you take a person without ALS, in a patient or a person with ALS, the person with ALS burns more calories, even when everything else is similar. There might be dysphagia, so that swallowing difficulty. If it's difficult to swallow foods, um, you're likely to consume less calories. Fatigue is a big contributor as well. So you know, a lot of um, patients might get tired more easily, be more tempted to sleep through a meal and obviously skip on those calories. Respiratory issues, you cannot swallow a bite of food and breathe at the same time. So if you're short of breath and you're having to take a small bite and then breathe and then take a small bite and breathe, obviously that's gonna impact how many calories you get in you. Self-feeding issues, so if you are no longer to move your hands or your arms to get food into your mouth and become reliant on others, you are gonna be at risk for losing weight. That's just because we, we consume so many mindless calories. You walk by the counter and you see a bowl of nuts or m and and you just grab a handful and pop it in your mouth. If you become reliant or dependent on other person, you're going to more likely lose out on all those extra calories. And then cooking and shopping dependence. So if you were the one that typically did the grocery shopping and the cooking, now you just have to communicate with your caregiver to make sure that you get the foods that you want. So that's just an extra layer of communication that you have to work through. We also know that there's an emotional aspect involved in maintaining weight. So this is a tough diagnosis to get. So you can have depression, anxiety, stress, which can cause lack of um, loss of appetite, lack of enjoyment. And if you ever feel any of those feelings, we just encourage you to reach out to your team, reach out to your support group so that we can help you work through those feelings. There also might be the fear of choking. So your once favorite food that pre pre 
provided a good source of calories, now it's a food that you fear that you might choke on and you create an aversion to it. So now you're avoiding that food and those calories. We know that less social interaction is a problem. So we tend to eat more calories when we eat with other people, but we know uh, when you're not able to go out to happy hours, you're not able to pick up the phone and call people um, and speak with them and invite them over, then you're less likely to have people over for meals. And like I said, um, when you eat alone, you tend to eat less calories. And then this feelings of failure. It's very discouraging to see the scale um, go down. It's very uh, feelings of guilt when your loved one makes your favorite food, they went to all these different stores to get the ingredients and then you're just too exhausted or now that's the food that gives you problems swallowing and you unfortunately had to tell them that you can't eat it um, and you feel like you let them down. So there's so many things that go into maintaining your weight. I took the concept from this slide from Dr. Riva Barrel's presentation back in September because I thought it was really cute. You also have a shift in food influencers. So on the left, you'll see all the celebrities from the Food Network. So you have Guy and Ina Garvin and Bobby Flay and Rachel Ray. And this is these are people that you look to to give you food ideas and you did it on your own. Um, at your own leisure, on your own time. You picked your show of interest, you turned it off when you no longer wanted to hear it. And but now you have people like me at the top, dietitians and a speech pathologists. That's our speech pathologist, Dan Kelly, below. And we are far less cute. We don't have the hair and makeup and the pretty lights. So, uh, but now you're stuck with looking at us. Um, and we're going to have some difficult conversations with you at some times and have to present some news that you might not want to hear. Um, so, so that's we're changing your influencers as well. And sometimes we are going to bring up a discussion of a feeding tube, and that's why we're here today. So a feeding tube is a flexible tube placed through the abdominal wall into the stomach. And there's two main times that we use, and these are uh, just different based on how they are placed. So you have a peg tube, which is percutaneous, which means through the skin, endoscopic, so they're going to use a scope or camera and insert it into your mouth, down your esophagus, and into your stomach to see where to place the tube. And the gastrostomy means an opening through your skin and into the stomach. And then you also have your rig tubes. So radiologically, that means it's carried out in the radiology department using an x-ray or other scanning equipment. It's inserted through your skin. And then again, you have the gastrostomy, the opening into your stomach. There are also tubes that go through your nose and to your stomach, which are called nasogastric tubes, but these are used for short-term use, so less than four to six weeks. They're also more visible and less comfortable, so that's why we typically go with the pigs or the rigs. They're more discreet. They're for longer-term use. You can tuck them into your clothes, and no one will even know that you have a feeding tube. What isn't a feeding tube, particularly for ALS patients? So there's this stigma associated with feeding tubes and say uh, people that suffer with dementia or what you're seeing in the media, the Terry Shivos, the Karen and Quinlan's, the Nancy Cruzens, these people that are in a minimally conscious state that are kept alive by feeding tubes. And these are people that are unable to fully interact with their environments. And when you're looking at your advanced directive or living will, most of these are focused on carrying out your wishes if you're ever in a state like this. But the majority of people with ALS have the capacity and competency to make decisions regarding their care. They're able to engage, still have some quality of life. Um, I know me personally as a healthcare employee, I only recommend a feeding tube if I feel it will enhance that specific patient's quality of life. If I feel that it's going to bring them harm, I'm not going to recommend it. So this is what a feeding tube is not for patients with ALS. So what is a feeding tube used for? Well, it's used to bypass the mouth and esophagus, particularly when there's swallowing um, dysfunction, and to provide supplemental or full nutrition to maintain weight and, and or hydration. So in the red, this is what is your typical route for getting food into your body. So you're going to take it into your mouth, um, it's going down into your esophagus and into your stomach. 
if you have swallowing problems, there's a fork in the road right here where food can either go to your esophagus or it could go down um, what we call the wrong pipe, the windpipe, which is your trachea, and down into your lungs. Obviously, we don't want food or liquids going into your lungs because you can get infections like pneumonia. Um, so the feeding tube is good because it bypasses all of that and it goes directly into your stomach down here. We typically see the swallowing difficulties with early onset in the patients with bulbar, bulbar onset disease as opposed to limb onset because the bulbar affects the muscles involved in speaking and swallowing and breathing. And so we typically have these discussions earlier with the bulbar onset patients. And this is what it looks like. So this is your abdominal cavity here. This is your stomach. This is your skin. Here's your feeding tube. It has an inner um, bumper or balloon and then an outer bumper. So your skin is sandwiched in between these two bumpers. And then you have a tube. And this is what it looks like on the outside. So typically an, an adult tube is 12 to 18 inches long. That way you can have some flexibility to get the feeds in. And at the bottom, there's this port in which you connect your feeding apparatus. There's also this option of what we call a low profile button. And the typical brand is Mickey. And so you'll see it's pretty similar to the regular um, G2, what we call them. So it has the inner balloon, this part goes through your skin, and on the outside, it has this feeding port. And when you are using it for your feed, your medications, your water, whatever you use your feeding tube for, it has this extension. So this extension goes directly into the feeding port when you're using it. And then when you're not using it, you just remove the extension and put the cover back on. And you'll see at the top picture, that's what it looks like. It was originally used in the pediatric population just so that the kids wouldn't be pulling at their tube, it'd be less noticeable, they could go out swimming or play sports, and it wouldn't be so much of a problem. But now they uh, create it for the adult population as well. Your indications for a feeding tube. So if nutrition or hydration is insufficient, so if you have weight loss, which is around five to 10% of what your usual weight is. That's how much you've lost. That's when we start getting concerned. If you're getting dehydrated, so we actually know that thin liquids are the most difficult to swallow. So your water, your tea, your lemonade, that's because they have a quick transit time. They go really quickly um, to the back of the throat. And so some patients might just need the feeding tube for hydration. They eat enough food to maintain their weight. They're getting enough calories in from the food, but the liquids is what is giving them a tr trouble. So we don't want them to be de dehydrated. So we might just use the tube for hydration purposes. Um, if you have problems with chewing or moving food or medication around your mouth, your tongue is getting weak, um, any swallowing in your muscles, in your throat, that might be an indication for a feeding tube. Fatigue, fatigue prevents adequate intake. So again, like I talked about, you might be very exhausted, sleeping through meals and losing weight. If it's taking you more than 45 minutes to consume a meal. So by spending so much time and energy eating from chewing and lifting the food up to the mouth, you might actually end up burning more calories than you're consuming. And then you're gonna lose more weight. So that's an indication as well. And then we're also gonna look at forced vital capacity and that's a respiratory measure. And we want that to be at least 50% just because if it's less than 50%, it's associated with increased complications related to the sedation, the anesthesia of placing the tube. I will say it's easier to have an open and informative conversation about feeding tubes before swallowing problems arise or become problematic. That way patients can start thinking about it without feeling the pressure of having to make a quick decision. So, if your FTZ is right at 50% and we're, we're saying you need to make this decision the next week, we like to give you uh, some warnings so that you can go home, discuss what matters to you, discuss it with your, your caregiver, your loved ones to see if it's the right decision for you. I'm also say if you think you're open to getting a feeding tube eventually, if it's somewhere on your radar, it's better to be proactive and get it early before you have any sort of weight loss, before any breathing issues arise, uh, before 
poor nutrition compromises your quality of life. So you're dehydrated, you have no energy because you're not eating as much. And that way also that you have the tube and you're familiar with it before you need it. So um, you have it before you're dealing with swallowing issues, before you're dealing with respiratory issues. Now you have to learn a new trick of the trade and you, you have to have this procedure and, and learn this feeding tube. That way all that's out of it. Um, so it's just less stressful to get early usually. The advantages of a feeding tube. Obviously, you can get adequate nutrition and hydration, and as we discussed before, weight is associated with longer survival. You can administer medication safely. So we know some of those medications are really big. Um, they're uncomfortable and difficult to swallow, so that way you can administer them through the tube. You obviously, since you are gonna be bypassing all the, the trachea, the windpipe, um, you can decrease the incidence of choking and therefore getting pneumonia from foods or liquids going down into your lungs. It can help reduce fatigue and promote the immune system. So a lot of people don't realize how dehydrated they might be and how much adequate hydration, adequate calories might give you some energy. And then you can conserve energy and time from eating meals for other activities that you find um, heighten your quality of life more. So. Um, ultimately, it comes down to the advantages being safety and quality of life. But with everything, there's disadvantages. So obviously, the tube insertion is a surgical procedure, and all surgeries come with a risk. You also have the potential side effects of a slight risk of infection or a leakage around the tube site, any sort of pain or discomfort at the site, tube displacement where the tube falls out. I would say that's relatively rare from my experience, but it can happen. And then intolerance to feeds. Sometimes a certain feed might not sit well with your stomach or you might have diarrhea. So we might have to give you, um, change up the feeds to see what works for you. And ultimately a feeding tube does not prevent the overall progression of ALS. Yes, we know that weight loss is associated with acceleration of the disease. But sadly, the disease will continue to advance whether or not you get a feeding tube just because of the progressive nature of the disease. So for the actual placement of the feeding tube, this is typically a same day procedure in your hospital. Um, overnight stay is generally not necessary. It might be required if you're malnourished or dehydrated and usually they can um, see that on your preoperative laboratories, like if your electrolytes are irregular and they need to keep you overnight to stabilize everything. The actual procedure only takes 20 to 40 minutes. I do tell my patients to plan to be there for about five hours just with the pre-op and then weaning off sedation afterwards, any sort of education and monitoring. They use local anesthesia at the site and then conscious sedation, which we used to refer to as twilight, they generally try to avoid general sedation due to increased respiratory risk, but ultimately the decision on anesthesia depends on the anesthesiologist's decision. There will be drainage around the site, typically for one to two days, and the skin should heal in two to three weeks. Everybody heals differently, um, but that's the general timeline. I did include links down below for the actual placement of the peg and a rig, um, just to give you an idea if you'd like to look at those. So recovery after tube placement. The recovery from sedation is usually within a couple hours. The tube may be used within the same day um, or within 24 hours, but that's up to the physician or your discharge instructions. Once home, your home health nurse uh, evaluate the tube site and reinforce education. And I will say the education really depends on your clinic, your facility. For us, I send information for, um, for videos as what to expect to patients the week before or the week of them getting their feeding tube. In the hospital, after they come out of the surgery, I meet to reinforce them on the education, but we know that education in the hospital isn't the greatest. You're usually groggy from surgery, you're in a different place, you're not able to retain a ton of information. So that's why we typically send out a home health nurse the next day once you're at home and to reinforce all that education. She shows you how to use she or he shows you how to use the tube 
and then they see you or your caregiver use the tube just so that you're familiar with using it and you feel comfortable doing it. And they can answer any questions while they're there. Formula and equipment is ordered by your ALS team and delivered to your home by a DME company or your durable medical equipment company. Materials and delivery may or may not be covered by insurance. So coverage is generally based off the speech pathologist assessment of swallowing function. Most of my patients have Medicare and Medicare is crazy. They usually have no problem covering the cost of the procedure. So the anesthesia, the surgery, even the overnight hospital stay. However, they might not co cover the cost of the actual fees going through. And Medicare typically requires at least 70% of calories be provided through the tube to cover it. So for patients that just need one or two feeds a day, they're generally not covered. There are supplemental and secondary insurances. I used to think these were the same thing, but they're not. So supplemental insurances go by Medicare guidelines. So if Medicare doesn't call, cover the cost of the feeds, the supplemental insurance will not either. But you have secondary insurance, they might pick up the cost. So you just have to talk with your, your team before then just to know what to expect. There's all these samples floating around. A lot of the feeding companies provide samples. Um, there's the Oli Foundation, which pairs people with equipment to those who need equipment. Um, they are really amazing to work with. And so um, you can always get someone to send you um, equipment and you just have to pay the cost for shipping. If the tube is placed prior to even needing um, feeds, we just educate on providing water flushes a couple of times a day to keep the tube clean. These next couple of questions are ones I get commonly from um, patients considering tubes. So do I have to have the tube forever? No, you do not. Um, if you decide to get the tube, you can also decide to have it removed. But the indication for feeding the tube in ALS does not result. So it's not like a stroke where you lost your swallowing function and you're able to regain muscle strength and muscle memory to be able to swallow again. We know this is a progressive disease. If you're getting the tube because you're having swallowing dysfunction, that swallowing dysfunction is only going to get worse. So the indication will always be there. However, you can remove the tube due to personal reasons or any sort of complications. And the tube can remove, be removed at any time after six weeks that is placed just because they want that, what they call the tract, the opening to mature in a way. So you have to wait six weeks, but it can be removed for any personal reason. Um, and it's just removed by a healthcare provider. It takes less than two minutes. It's very quick. You can just do it in the outpatient clinic. You don't even have to go to the hospital and the skin closes up within one to two weeks. Can I still eat with a tube? Yes, this is my biggest question. Yes, yes, yes. Depending on your ability to swallow safely. We, if you can swallow, we want you to swallow. We know that eating is a high factor in determining quality of life. We know people love to eat. So if you still want to eat, even just for pleasure and get the majority of nutrition through your tube, yes, we want you to be able to eat if it's safe for you. And many of the patients initially use the tube to deliver supplemental nutrition or just hydration or medications, um, but ultimately the tube can be used as a sole method of nutrition. So we do have some patients that rely 100% on their tube to meet their nutrition and hydration needs. What goes through the tubes? So medications, if they're in liquid form, great. If um, they, they're in regular pill form, they can be crushed and dissolved in water and flushed through the tube, no problem. The only problem with medications is the time released or extended release that have these what we call enteric coatings on them. Um, or if they're in capsule form, they cannot be crushed. So you'd have to work with your healthcare team to kind of find uh, substitutions or different forms of these medications. Formulas can go through the tube, those are your feeds. They can be commercialized. These are typically ready to use, eight ounce containers like Insure or Boost. There's so many different formulas, Jevity, Tucal, you know, um, and then, uh, or blenderized fees. So they actually have commercial blenderized fees. They're typically a little bit more expensive. So insurance wants you to try out the standard ones first. Um, and if you have intolerance, then they can justify the commercialized blenderized fees. If you want to make blenderized fees at home, that's fine. We just make sure that it's the same consistency of, of, about the insurance. So you might have to add 
um, broth or some water to dilute it a little bit so it's not um, too thick to get to the tube. However, insurances are not going to cover, cover your groceries that you use for your home blue dry seeds. Um, you can also put, obviously, water through the tubes, any sort of electrolyte solutions. So if you've been having diarrhea, you're losing a lot of potassium, we might recommend that you have some Gatorade or Pedialyte through the tube. With some of our patients, especially if they're on antibiotics, um, we want to give them some probiotics. Unfortunately, probiotics come in capsule form. So we usually recommend kefir, which is a liquid yogurt that has a lot of probiotics, and we recommend that go through the feeding tube as well. What doesn't go through the tube? Well, whole pills, obviously, because they'll get clogged. We want you to crush them first. Medicine mixed with the feeds. So we want you to administer your medications, flush it with water, get everything out of the tube, and then administer your feeds. If the medicines and the feeds interact, the proteins and the feeds can clog, uh, cause a little clog in the tube. So that's why we don't want to administer them separately. Juice, just because it's sticky um, and and also the more acidic juices like orange juice or pineapple juice can bind with other feeds or medications and create a clog. Sodas, a lot of people swear by soda to get clogged out too. We'll address clogs later, but especially the darker sodas can erode the, inside the tube over time. And things that, and, um, substances that are at hot temperatures. One, you don't want to administer a very hot or cold substance just because it goes straight into your stomach. Um, it might be uncomfortable, um, but also hot temperatures can erode the tube. I know coffee is a, a loved item by a lot of people. Um, it is a little bit more acidic, but I know a lot of people love quality for their quality of life. So we, um, that's fine if you do coffee. We just recommend it be room temperature and that you flush well before and after with water. So this is what it's going to look like to administer your feeds or medication. So we want you to wash your hands like you would before sitting down for a meal that you're going to eat by your mouth. This is meal time. So we want you to wash your hands, raise the bed just so you don't reflux the feeds. So when you're lying flat, that's zero degrees. If you're um, straight up, right, that's 90 degrees. So we want you around a 30 degree angle at least, which is a third of the way up. We want you to check the tube site in the stomach. So these are rather benign pictures, um, but if you're not feeling well, if you feel like you're gonna throw up, obviously you wouldn't be eating a meal by mouth. So we're not gonna wanna use the tube either. If there's redness around the tube or swelling, it's like uncomfortable, it's oozing different, different things, we don't want you to use the tube. Um, if you have a fever, there might be a sign of infection. We want you to call your healthcare provider. And so it should be like the bottom picture, just clean, pretty, soft stomach, ready to go. Then we're going to administer the feeds and medication. So we want to flush with water first. That way we can just lubricate, lubricate the inside of the tube. Then you administer your feed or medication, and then you flush afterwards. So a common question is, can my home health aides or my CNAs, my certified nursing assistants, administer my feeds? Most states say, no, they can't, which is a little bit crazy because we are training you as the patient or your, um, your caregiver who have no medical backgrounds <laughs> to be able to administer these feeds. But um, that's a common question. So I just want to address that, that usually the home health aides are not allowed to um, put anything through the tubes, just nurses. Nurses. Okay, so this is how it looks like you're going to, there's a couple ways to administer the feeds. This is using a syringe and what we call a bolus. So you can take the top, the plunger part off of the syringe and just pour um, the substance through the tube. So the tubes are typically, or the syringes are typically 60 milliliters, which are two ounces. And the cans of feeds are typically eight ounces. So you're gonna have to wait for it to go down four times but it still usually takes less than five minutes. You can also use syringe, syringe the typical way in which you um, dip the tip of the syringe down into the, the liquid, the feed, and then um, pull it up and then push it down, push, push a plunger down into the tube. I also include this link to a video by Quorum or CDS, and it's just a five to six minute video on how to do this. And I'm just a very visual person, so I love videos. 
And there's also an option for a gravity bag. So insurances will typically cover the syringes or the gravity bags, no questions. And the gravity bag, they'll send you a poll as well. And the gravity bags are nice in that they can allow for slower feed. So if the bolus method is too quick for you, um, you can have the gravity bag and you can adjust it so that it feeds over 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, another advantage is that you can pull and pour all eight ounces into the bag and just walk away versus the syringe you had to keep refilling. But with the syringe, it's just a little bit um, more compatible with getting around. So if you're going out to the mall or, or vacation or something, you just have the syringe and the feeds and that's pretty easy and ready to go. And then another option is a feeding pump. So pumps, because they cost more money, they require additional documentation for insurance coverages. But I do have a couple patients on pumps. Um, one particular uses it because he's not able, um, he doesn't have the hand necessary to do his own feeds. During the day, his wife works and he does have nursing aides, but again, they're not allowed to administer feeds through his feeding tube. And so when his wife gets home, she hooks him up to the feeding pump and the feeds administer overnight. And then when they wake up, then she disconnects him. So that way he's fed for the day. He just gets his feeds at night. But the feeding pump, you can adjust it to go over however many hours. Um, it's usually around eight to 12. So your feeds, your medications are in. So you're gonna cap the feeding to port on your feeding tube or your button. Then you're gonna wash the syringe or if you have the extension tubing with soap and warm water like you would any other dishes and then just rinse the soap off and let them air dry. If you're using bags like the gravity bags or the bags for the pump, those are disposed of each day. So your DME company will send you one for each day. And then we wanna keep your head elevated for 30 to 60 minutes just to prevent any sort of reflux. And the general recommendation is to not have a feed within two hours of bed, just to prevent reflux. Okay, leftover feeds. So any unused portion should be stored in the refrigerator, covered and dated. And so I have some patients that require, let's say four containers of feeds a day, but they only want three feeds a day, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they'll do one and a third container. So they always have a container that's open and in the fridge. So when you're gonna use the refrigerator formula, we just, again, we don't want it to be really chilled and going straight into your stomach. So we just recommend that sit out and get to room temperature. Um, but obviously you don't wanna sit out for too long. So max of 30 minutes before using it. And then just discard any formula that has been open for more than 24 hours. Cleaning the tube site, um, we recommend you just do this once a day. Whenever you're showering or bathing, you just use soap, warm water. Um, people use gauze or washcloth or a Q-tip. Some people put barrier cream under the tube just to, protect, to have another layer to protect their skin. We used to recommend these split gauzes, which is in that picture, to be placed under the bumper to absorb any sort of mo moisture. But we noticed that this was creating a friction with the skin and creating some skin breakdown. So we don't usually recommend split gauzes anymore. Um, if you do, we recommend you actually put them on the, the top, on the other side of the bumper and to absorb any sort of moisture that comes around the bumper. All right, other common questions. Can I still take showers? Yes. Um, at our facility, we just want you to wait 48 hours after surgery to take a shower. Can I still take a bath or go swimming? So submerging your, your tube in water. Yes, once the site is completely healed. We know this varies between patients. It could be as early as two to three weeks, but we generally say wait to about four weeks. How long does it uh, the feeds take to administer? So I, I mentioned this briefly before, but if you're doing the bolus method with the syringes, that's generally less than five minutes. If you're going with a gravity bag, you can adjust the time, but it's usually 15, 15 to 20 minutes. And then the pump, again, it's typically eight to 12 hours. You can adjust it. Do I need to get the tube replaced routinely? So this is up to your surgeon. Ours says no. And the literature, they looked at to see if there was any benefit of replacing it routinely before it breaks, um, but there wasn't a huge benefit. So our surgeon just waits until that there's, there's a problem with the tube, but other facilities might replace those routinely every six or nine or 12 months. 
can I taste the feeds? Maybe. So typically the feeds come in a plain flavor. There is vanilla, so I had some patients request vanilla. I do suggest not going with something like chocolate or vanilla if it's colored, just because it's heaven forbid you have some bleeding in your stomach, those colors can mask the bleeding. So these are some com complications with feeding tubes. And so I just wanted to go over um, causes and treatment. So if your tube is dislodged, so if it's ac accidentally pulled off or the inner or the outer bumper falls off, we want you to immediately call your surgeon's office just because if you see the surgeon within an hour or two, they can um, just put in a new tube into the hole. If the hole starts closing up, they're gonna have to completely redo the surgery. Usually you can't just walk into your surgeon's office, so they're probably gonna tell you to go to ER and get it replaced. If the tube is clogged, it's probably because either the tube was not properly flushed. So again, we want you to flush before and after with water. The meds are not crushed enough. Um, the meds are combining with the feeds or the feeds are too thick. And that's generally for your home blood rice feeds. So in these cases, we want you to um, use warm water with a syringe and just gently push and pull back and forth. You can usually see in the tube where the clog is. So we just recommend that you take your two fingers and massage that site and try to break up the, the clog from the outside. You might have reflux. So this might be because your head is not elevated. So, oh, um, it says my screen share sharing is paused. Can you still see my screen? Stephanie, we see, we see the troubleshooting complications slide. Oh, okay, sorry, I just got an alert saying you couldn't see. Okay. All right, sorry about that. Um, so if you have reflux, we want to keep your head up during feeds and then 30 to 60 minutes afterwards. Again, your last feed should be within two hours of bedtime. And then if you have a history of reflux or think reflux is the issue, we can also give you reflux medications. For constipation. So I would actually say that constipation usually improves after a feeding tube is placed just because hydration and fiber content to play a large part in bowel regularity. And so once you're actually getting that through the tube, you're no longer as constipated as often. But for constipation, provision is the key. So a normal bowel move, movement regimen is considered three bowel movements a day to one bowel mo movement every three days. So if you're coming up on three days of no bowel movement, we want you to start taking some medications like stool softeners and laxatives, because if you go much further than that, it get, can get really impacted in there. So we want to review your fluid intake. So if you have inadequate fluid, we're gonna ask you to increase your free water flush. The feeds alone will not cover all your hydration needs. So we're gonna recommend regardless additional water flush through your tube, but if you're constipated, we might review that and see that you need more water. We're going to review your fiber intake. I say fiber will either make or break you. So you might have inadequate fiber, you might have excessive fiber. So we'll review the fiber content. It might change you to a different feed based on the fiber content. Um, we'll review mobility. And so if you're sedentary, your gut is likely going to be more sedentary. So we might recommend increased activity. I know um, in the ALS population, usually this isn't possible, but if you do have some local room for that, and we will ask you to be a little bit more mobile. And then if we're concerned that it's impacted in there, you've gone six plus days, no bowel movement, um, then we're gonna ask for radiology. So an X-ray or abdominal CAT scan, in which you might have to go to the hospital and get an enema and disimpaction and bowel meds. So that's why we always want to prevent constipation before it gets to this point. We also might be looking at medications that might be associated with constipation, particularly narcotics. Um, might be some get gut dysbiosis, so your microbiome, they're doing a lot of research on that, and might suggest a uh, probiotic. For diarrhea, so this is defined as four or more liquid bowel movements a day. So some medications have um, sugar alcohol, so sorbitol or xylitol, in which case, if that's a problem, we want to eliminate these solutions and change to a different medication. 
you might have too many bowel med meds, so you would overboard on the stool softeners or laxatives, in which case we would decrease those. You might have recently been on antibiotics and it wiped out your healthy gut bacteria, in which case we would recommend a probiotic um, if you're not able to take a probiotic by milk. Again, there's not a great one to go through the tube, so we might recommend some kefir for your tube. We also might be ruling out infection, um, primarily C. diff, which is associated with antibiotics and causing diarrhea. We might also review your feeds. So if your feeds are hyperosmolar, which is a fancy way of saying concentrated, we might change you to a less dense feed or add some water um, along with your feeds. And or fiber-free feeds, we might consider adding feeds with fiber or um, if you're having diarrhea and you can take things by mouth or if you could put through the tube, the BRAT diet, which stands for the bananas, rice, applesauce, and tea might be helpful for that. I then um, asked a couple of our patients to share their views on getting the feeding tube and their experiences. So I have two quotes. This quote is from um, Sydney's spouse. So he wrote it on behalf of her after talking with her. And he said, we never realized how large a part dining together, both home and at area restaurants played in our social life and home life. After some resistance, Sydney began to feeding about seven months ago. Some of her comments are, I'm used to it now. You can get used to anything in life. I mainly regret not eating on holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas when the food looks and smells especially good. I'm still able to taste small bits of food, including ice cream. The upside is that she is now getting the proper nutrition daily and has regained some of her lost weight. Sydney also is staying active, shoveling snow, really, and she's the age of my grandma. She is so crazy. Um, dragging in logs, and lighting up the fireplace. I cannot stop her from cooking um, a few times a week. So as you can see, Sydney still, even though she's only able to eat pleasure foods like ice cream every now and then, um, and gets the majority of her food and nutrition through her feeding tube, but she still has a great quality of life. All right, next one. So this is a physician. So as a physician working on a Jerry Psych unit, I was not a fan of feeding tubes. I saw many cases where patients lost their capacity for decision making and their quality of life was miserable. They lacked the cognitive capacity to understand why they could no longer have anything PO, which means by now. The ironies of having made my living caring for patients with neurodegenerative disease and hating feeding tubes only to end up having both is not lost on me. I decided that I would have a pig tube very soon after my diagnosis was confirmed, long before I needed it. Food and eating has become much less of an emotional decision for me as time passes. In some ways, I feel like the tube has liberated me. Eventually, I got to a point where I would weigh the risk of choking and aspirating versus the appeal of the food. Don't get me wrong, if I could tolerate a screaming hot bowl of snow loaded with sriracha and jalapeno slices, I would do it in a heartbeat. But at this point, I am almost as happy and far, far safer having a non-peppery bite or two of soup solids, followed by a pouch in my tube. I have to say that I don't at all regret getting the tube. I'm still having way too much fun when I'm not at the table. So ultimately, this is your decision and it's our support. At the end of the day, our job as your ALS healthcare team is to provide you all the information you need to make an informed decision regarding whether or not a tube is right for you. At the same time, we recognize that for many patients, getting a feeding tube is less about the tube itself and more about admitting that their disease has progressed more than they ever wanted it to, which is obviously very hard to overcome. So know that we love you guys, we care for you, and we want to help you make this decision. Here's some resources. The first one being an online brochure written by a person with ALS who also had a feeding tube about some things that he wished he had known before he got a feeding tube. Obviously, you always have your ALS associations and your local chapters that provide support groups, also social workers that can help with getting the feed supplies. And the Oli Foundation, like I mentioned earlier, they have support groups and they also provide the free feeding equipment exchange, which is super useful. So thank you for allowing me to present. I'm very excited to answer any of your questions. Oh, 
Thank you, Stephanie. This is Cynthia. Thanks so much. Um, that was really a fabulous overview of the features and benefits of feeding tubes. And, and I really appreciate that you went into the rationale behind why feeding tubes are recommended for people, as well as the timing with regard to feeding tube recommendations. Um, because, of course, we know everyone's disease unfolds at a, at a different pace. Um, I do want to apologize for some of the static on the line. I've had several messages about that, and we've been working on that technical issue on the back end of it. So I apologize for the static that you had to deal with. Um, nonetheless, we've had some questions um, related to this. Um, let's see, the first question. Can I put my dinner in a blender to liquefy it and then pour it into my feeding tube? Yes, a lot of our patients do that. So they'll sit down for their meal and they'll eat what they can. And whatever they don't finish eating, they'll, um, again, add a broth or water and put it in a blender and through the tube. Absolutely. Um, can you address to what manner of liquefaction that has to be? Because we know everyone's blender may work a little bit differently. Not everyone has the a uh, super powered blender, what consistency should that be to make it safe to put in the feeding tube? So I would say that anything that is pourable, it could be a little bit more thick than water, but not by that much. So if you're used to anything that um, like Insure or Boost products, those protein drinks, that's the consistency we're going for. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, another question here. Um, can adult, This seems to refer back to one of your earlier images. Can adults get the flat profile button type tube connector like the one the child has? Yes, yes. And we used to place those pretty routinely just because our patients requested it. We haven't been placing them as much recently just because they they have the balloon inner bumper instead of the regular rubber bumper compared to the other feeding tube. Um, so for some reason, the balloon, the inner balloon bumpers haven't given us as much success, so we've had to replace them more often. So we've kind of geared away from that, that button, that low profile Mickey tube, but it's definitely still an option and a lot of patients still request it. Thank you. Thanks for addressing that, because that looks like um, an alternative to one of the challenges that some people find with the tubes, and that is um, how to keep that tube from dangling and keep it affixed to the stomach. Yeah, for sure. So do you have any recommendations on how to, once the tube is placed, it's still dangling outside of the person's stomach and how how can people address that should they take that down or wrap their stomach or wear tighter or looser clothing how is that dangling um, feeding tube addressed yeah i mean people really get creative so some people tape it which i don't usually recommend just because the tape can be harsh on your skin some people tuck it into their belt or their pocket. Some people take a very big paper clip and hold it um, to like a, especially if you have a button down shirt, um, connect it to one of those buttons. Of course, you don't want to um, poke a hole through the tube while you're putting the paper clip around it. So you have to be careful. But those are some of the ideas. There are such things as abdom abdominal binders. So it's basically like a, a large flat belt that can be used around. So some people use that as well. You just don't want to use too much pressure so that it's uncomfortable and making a mark on your skin from the pressure. But those are just all different ways that you can kind of um, deal with not getting the tube pulled. Great, great. And you know, someone had submitted something about um trying to use adhesive or uh, to bandage that tube to the skin and their issue was the sticky adhesive that builds up on the skin. Um, is there something that either you or maybe the nurse at the DME company could recommend 
if someone had been using tape or a Band-Aid to remove the adhesive buildup on the skin? I've never really come across that problem. Usually that adhesive comes off with just some warm soap and water. Um, I see. Great, great. Sorry, sorry I don't I believe have a solution folks that. that. Well, this is, this is, uh, these are open questions. Um, I believe we had a comment here stating that someone who had been admitted to hospice service said the hospice nurses have um, like an alcohol pad, but it's not alcohol that they use to remove adhesive. It was more of an oil-based pad that okay. easily removed remaining adhesive. So you may want to reach out to your DME company, the company that provides your um, equipment or feeding supplies to see if they have adhesive remover pads um, on that. And another question, oh, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, someone had submitted a, a comment in the, in the question box about using Ensure or Ensure Plus. Many people use that and use that PO, they take that by mouth. But then when they get the feeding tube, they find that they no longer tolerate the Ensure or the Ensure Plus. Um, have you found um, situations like that to occur? And then what would be the next step to address that intolerance? There shouldn't be any biological reason for you not to tolerate it. Um, if you're tolerating it by mouth, it's going directly down the, the esophagus into your stomach. And so if you can tolerate it that way, you should be able to tolerate it directly into your stomach. But who knows if, it, if it's from something else that's going on, if you have anxiety or stress, or if you're now less mobile, if, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things, if, if you've been on antibiotics recently, or if your medications have changed now. So it might not be the actual insure versus something else going on. But there's always that other option that there's so many different feeds on the market that, um, and there's so many companies that are willing to send samples to give you, to allow you to try it before you commit, that it's usually, I, I've never had a problem getting feeds for patients to tolerate. It might take a couple tries, but eventually we get it. Great, great. Thing. So what would be your first call if you were having some intolerance and you weren't sure if it was Another medication you were taking or the type formula, would that be to the dietitian or the clinic? What would be the first best call? Yeah, good question. I, I wouldn't even try to figure it out by yourself. Um, I would just immediately just call your clinic and see. I mean, I know all clinics don't have dietitians, so see what um, your, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, um, whoever can kind of go through your medication list, go look through the feeds. The DME companies who are providing, typically providing the feeds, some of them have dietitians on staff, so you can work with them to kind of review what might be a better pr product for you. But like I said, sometimes it's the fiber content. Sometimes it's how dense the formula is. Sometimes it might be the certain ingredients within the feeds. So um, yeah, that's, we don't want to put that onus on you to try to figure out, definitely reach out and see if one um, of your healthcare providers can help you troubleshoot that. Oh, great. You know, and knowing who to make that first call to, I think, is, is so important, especially when it's something related to intolerance. Um, you definitely want to go to uh, one of your healthcare providers. Um, alternately, sometimes people that have experience having feeding to themselves um, have some great recommendations. And we have someone that posted a question in the comment box here stating that they have had a feeding tube since December of 2019 and they are very pleased with the outcome of that, um, adding that they um, utilize a t-shirt with a hole cut in it to address that dangling feeding tube. So um, okay. yeah. that's a great idea to be able to do. This. And then of course you can easily tape the, the tube to, to that t-shirt that has a hole in it. Um, and these days you can, you know, use college t-shirts, your, your favorite pro teams, your <laughs> March Madness team that you're uh, pulling for. Um, right, so thank you for making that, um, that rec recommendation. Um, a few more questions about medications. How to dispense medicine through the tube? I know you addressed that a little bit earlier. Um, 
medication can be dispensed through the tube, but you said there was an exception? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and, and if you have limited ability to swallow, I say do not waste it on medication. Save it on your vice of choice, ice cream, pizza, whatever it might be. Um, but so for medications through a tube, if they're in liquid form, absolutely no problem. Obviously, they can go through the tube. If they are regular pill form, we ask that you crush it and make a slurry in some water, and then you can flush it through the tube. The only problem is with what we call the time release, the extender release ones that have what's called an enteric coating surrounded them. Those are meant to go through your stomach and, and, and be absorbed in your intestines. So when you crush them, that means they're gonna be destroyed in your stomach and never get to your intestines further down. So um, then there's also capsules. So we don't want you to open up the capsules and um, typically some capsules can be opened up and sent through the tube, but um, for the most part, we just want you to talk with your pharmacist or your healthcare team and figure out a different um, means of getting that medication into you. Well, it sounds like there are a number of different options, but always good to ask. Um, just a quick follow-up comment. Uh, Ms. Patricia has put a comment in our question box regarding adhesive remover, stating that people who use um, colostomies or ostomies often have adhesive remover pads. So um, there certainly is a product available through your DME company if you need to um, remove some adhesive that you have sticking to your skin. Um, quick follow-up question on the medicine. Can medicines be mixed together in a single dose? We usually do not recommend it just because the different medications can interact and possibly clog the tube. So great question, but we usually recommend that they be crushed and sent through the tube separately. Great, great, good to know, good to know. Um, okay, here's an interesting question. It may be timely due to the, the season of the year that we're in right now. For religious purposes, can I put wine in the feeding tube? <laughs> um, nobody outright ever asks me these questions, but I usually get to it, and I know patients are putting some wine down there too. I'm fine with it. Obviously, uh, a lot of our patients are on rilazole, um, which can impact the liver. I know a lot of patients are getting their liver enzyme tests taken regularly, just to make sure they're okay. So obviously, alcohol can impact your liver as well. So that's one reason why you would not put um, alcohol through your tube if you already have liver problems. Also, if you're at fall risk, we don't want you to be you know, a little bit unsteady from the alcohol itself. But otherwise, I'm fine, especially if you're just putting like an ounce of wine down your tube, just flush it well with water before and afterwards like you normally would just so that doesn't get sticky and create a clog. Okay, good Good to know. I see that we are running past our allocated time. Um, I just want to uh, sneak in one more comment. Uh, someone had made a comment about um, the amount of sugar that may be in their either their feeding formula or what they're putting in their feeding tube. And I know you mentioned something about that earlier. Um, is sugar a quote unquote suspect when it comes to some issues with feeding tubes? Is that something we should just make a note of? Um, to identify and then particularly look at? Yeah, particularly if it's just a simple sugar without any sort of other like fats or proteins involved. So your, your protein groups like Ensure, a lot of the formulas are going to have sugar in them, but they also have other things that are going to balance it out. But things like juice are just pretty much just sugar and water, and that makes it very sticky. So that's the only reason we um, are concerned. But I mean, obviously, have, if you have diabetes, if you have something else that where sugar might be an issue, then we would just work with you to lower the sugar content. But yeah, the biggest concern with putting sugary substances down the tube is the, the clogging risk. Very good. Thanks so much. You know, we so many of these questions were practical in nature. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we had an opportunity to spend 10, 10 or 12 minutes or so regarding um, questions people had. Um, Ms. Stephanie, thank you so much for carving time out of your day to share this information. And certainly for those of you that have joined us on our webinar, 
Again, this webinar has been recorded. It takes about 24 hours to get the recorded link back on our ALS Association website. You can also reach out to your local chapter to access uh, the link for that recorded call. Thank you again so much for joining us. I know that uh, the option of looking at a feeding tube to address some of the challenges people may have with swallowing um, or are a challenge. We appreciate Ms. Stephanie's sharing information about the features and benefits of that feeding tube and also the process that's involved um, in getting that feeding tube and then taking care of it afterwards. Um, I wish all of you a very blessed afternoon. Please continue to stay safe out there. And we look forward to having you join us in April for our Living with ALS educational topic call in April. You'll be able to find the topic and the direct link for that at the ALS Association website or through your local chapter. Thanks very much. Again, continue to stay safe out there. Good day.